We'll start in in two minutes. So if, if everyone wants to introduce themselves in the chat, because then we're going to disable the chat in, in a few minutes. Okay, so I guess it's 10 and we do have a lot to say. So let's get started. Um, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this panel discussion organized in partnership with Everyday Orientalism, the Egypt's Dispersed Heritage Project and the EES. We'll be discussing the ethics of caring for and about ancient Egyptian human remains. Each of the panelists will give a 10 minute presentation followed by a period of discussion, which I will moderate and during which we will take questions from the audience. So I'm gonna put, um, Carl, if you wanna disable the chat, I don't know if it's disabled now. So I'm gonna put a link to most of the scripts from today. So if you need it to follow along, don't hesitate to take a look at it. Um, the chat is going to be disabled, but the Q&A function is going to be open during the whole duration of the event. Um, feel free, oh, yeah, I meant to share. I did have a, sorry. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So um, if, if you're going to tweet about this, feel free to use the hashtags on the slide. So hashtag EOTalks and hashtag Mummies Ancestors. So um, I'm going to start us off. So I'll do my own introduction. My name is Charlotte Parrain. I'm an object conservator specializing in archaeological conservation. I'm the 2019-2020 Samuel H. Kress Conservation Fellow in the Organic Materials Lab at the Royal Ontario Museum. I hold the Master of Art Conservation from Queen's University. I have pursued conservation internships in uh, institutions including the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and the Centre de Conservation du Québec. I have also been a field conservator on archaeological projects in Northern Mongolia and at Abydos in Egypt. So um, as a way to set the stage for this panel, I'm going to tell you about my recent encounter with an ancient Egyptian man in the Royal Ontario Museum collection. First of all, I'm tuning in today from Quebec City on the Nyon Wensio, our beautiful territory of the Wendat Nation. 
It was also the traditional territory of indigenous peoples known as the Iroquoians of the St. Lawrence. They are the ones who named this place Quebec, which means where the river narrows. I did my work on ancient Egyptian human remains in Toronto on the shores of Lake Ontario from which the St. Lawrence River outflows. Toronto comes from Takaronto, a Mohawk word which means where the trees stand in the water. It is on the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabe Nation, including the Mississaugas of Credit First Nation. The individual this presentation focuses on lived around another river far away from the St. Lawrence River and Lake Ontario. He resides at the Rum now. Sometimes I think of how he is amongst other people's ancestors, and I catch myself hoping that they are in good relation. This presentation will include blurred images of human, of human remains, but before I show an image of human remains, I will include a red star in the corner of the preceding slide. Sorry, Charlotte. Um, yeah. Could you share your actual presentation? At the moment, oh, I think we just see the back end of it. Oh. Just to make sure that the warning is, is visible. Oh. Bring your, now can you, can you see it now? No, just the back, just the actual PowerPoint we can see. Uh, oh, okay. I think if you stop the share and then go back to screen, uh, share screen. Can you see it now? Yes, that's perfect. Oh, okay. So I'll just, I'll just show you again. This is Quebec. This is Toronto, and this is Luxor. Yeah, so this presentation is going to include images of human remains, as I said, and I'm going to show a red star in the corner of the preceding slide when there's human remains in the, in the following slide. So I arrived to the ROM in September of 2019 as a Crest Conservation Fellow. One of my main projects was the conservation of the mummy from the coffin of Tahat the mummified remains of a man in his 20s buried in a reused coffin bearing the name of a woman called Tahat. He has been given nicknames over the years, which I do not use. I call him the young man. There is very little about him in the museum collection database. So the first step of, uh, the, of the conservation process is an examination in a condition report. I sat by the young men and proceeded to document and map the damage that I saw. It was extensive. Amongst other things, I noted a partial unwrapping, a broken skull, a missing toe, extensive damage at the waist, including disturbed vertebrae, packing material and soft tissues, and the loss of associated burial goods, including the coffin. It is impossible to record these kinds of things without having an emotional reaction. Despite our fields insistent on scientific objectivity, I wrote down in the report that I found a lot of this damage upsetting. When faced with physical damage, a conservator's process is to look for the agents of deterioration that caused it. Physical forces, incorrect temperature, vandalism, pests, and so on. But that felt inadequate in so many ways. I thought I needed to look a little deeper. What attitudes, what events were at the source of the damage that I documented? I decided to piece together his post-excavation story. I looked through museum and newspaper archives and interviewed past and present museum staff. Like most of the Egyptian collection, the young man was quote unquote collected in Egypt in the early 20th century by Charles Trick Corelli, one of the Rums founders. He was an ambitious, audacious, visionary museum builder. He is known as an adventurer and as Canada's Indiana Jones. But he was like Indiana Jones in more ways than one. His autobiography tells of his adventures, but it also exposes his contempt for local communities, including his workers, who he called simple people, likened to animals, treated like machines, and as if they were disposable. It is in this context that the young man was excavated, in the context of imperial archaeology, which put little value on the bodies of modern Egyptians and used the bodies of ancient Egyptians to advance scientific racism and eugenics. In 1906, Carilli wrote a letter in which he documents that archaeologist Robert Mond offered him a set of four beautifully painted coffins he excavated at Tombs of the Nobles in Luxor. A few years ago, departmental associate and gallery interpreter Mark Trampor and Egyptologist and educator Gil Gibson looked into this letter. 
They have shown convincingly that the four coffins are those of Pitikans, Esmut, Jamadasank, and Tahat. This last one contains the young men, as we know. So the coffin and the human remains within it were bound for Toronto. Carilli likely packed the coffin himself. He wrote that bad packing can destroy, destroy priceless objects and good packing requires knowledge and much care. But he also transported totem poles by floating them down a canal and cutting them into segments while still afloat. So while he intended to transport everything safely, it's reasonable to question his methods. So did a lack of padding, maybe due to a lack of concern for the human remains, cause the damage to the skull? The coffin was probably transported down the Nile, maybe to Cairo. While I have no records of shipping, it seems likely that the coffin was then transported by rail to the Swiss Canal, boated down to Port Said before leaving Egypt. It probably made a stop in London before being transported across the Atlantic up to the Gulf of the St. Lawrence, and then up the river, passing by Quebec City and going all the way to Toronto on the shores of Lake Ontario, very far from home. So did a difficult journey, maybe marked by rough handling and the repetitive movements of a boat at sea, cause the damage to the spine of the young men? It's unclear exactly when the young men got to Toronto, but I believe that it was sometime before November 1907, in time for an open casket exhibition. I did not find any images or mentions of the young man in his coffin for the period between 1907 and 1968. It is possible that he was moved into the museum building when it first opened in 1914. However, it's also possible that he was moved around different storage spaces in Toronto over the years. Was he stored in unsuitable spaces where mold could grow in his body? He was x-rayed in 1968, probably at the Rum. This past January, we finally found the long lost x-rays at the bottom of a drawer in the Egyptian department. Among the few images of the young men that were in the museum files, there was this newspaper clipping. On it, the abdomen of the young men is intact, indicating that the severe damage occurred later. I learned from a Globe article that the young man was unwrapped by a curator and a conservator at the Ram on May 18, 1971. The article clarifies that the goal of the unwrapping was to identify the biological sex of the remains, thus checking if this was the mummy of Tahat. It is unclear why that was necessary since the museum already had x-rays which allowed a good estimation of sex. I also found this second, much more extensive article in the Toronto Daily Star. It is a truly bizarre read. It goes back and forth between the plot of the 1932 movie, The Mummy, and the unwrapping of the rum. It excitedly describes the event as a sacrilege, which it certainly was. It exposed what, what, what was not meant to be seen. The article quote curator Nicholas Millet as saying that, quote, we don't enjoy disturbing the rest of anyone, but we learned so much that the temptation is irresistible. As Chris Christina Riggs wrote, quote, for European rationality to triumph, there could be little reg regard for what other lesser cultures, living or dead, considered sacred. And so, quote, strips of linen fell aside like autumn leaves. I also learned from this article that TV crews from the CBC and CTV were present at the unwrapping. The author says that it would make a fine movie, as macabre as The Mummy, but a lot funnier. I did find the CBC footage in their archives, and it is not funny. It is hard not to notice how vulnerable the young man looks. To quote Christina Riggs again, quote, the decision to unwrap is a declaration based not merely on cultural difference, but on power differentials, unquote. Colonial power dynamics were reenacted when the young man was unwrapped. The ROM still has some of the young men's loose wrappings stored in three drawers marked probably 91093. Shortly after the unwrapping, the coffin and the young men within it was put on display in a muff tomb exhibit until around 1979 when the galleries closed for major renovations. By the mid 1980s, the young men had been nicknamed Jeremy. The coffin was examined and treated by conservation in 1991. In 1992, when the Egyptian gallery reopened, Tahat's coffin was displayed upright. There is no question that by this time, the body and the coffin had become separated. 
Were the soft tissues around his waist broken and displaced when he was lifted out of the coffin? That seems likely. From the early 1990s onwards, the young man was on a shelf on a piece of plywood wrapped up tightly in plastic sheeting. He remained that way until 2019. Did the organic, the acidic organic vapors, did acidic organic vapors build up within his undignified airtight enclosure and cause degradation of the linens and remains? In 2019, he was taken to the conservation lab. As conservators, we're trained to notice the trace, the residue, the loss, what is left or missing on objects as a result of interactions with people and the environment. Those marks and losses tell us about damage, condition, and stability, but they also hold stories and meanings. Our examinations of objects and human remains give us some access to those stories. As Vern Harris wrote, quote, what is present speaks loudly of absences, and what is absent presents itself insistently. Presence and absence unfolding out of one, one another, that is, the experience of being haunted, unquote. On the young men, traces tell of the haunting histories of imperialism, displacement, scientific hubris, and custodial neglect. So where do I go from here? How can a conservator honestly reckon and engage critically with the young men's histories and care for him in a way that acknowledges that he is, as Harris would say, cluttered by ghosts? What is a conservator's responsibility to the human remains, to the person that they were slash are, and to the stories that they hold? During the years that the young men spent wrapped up in plastic, every time Gail, now a volunteer, walked by him, she recited a short offering formula, bread and beer for your spirit. She told me she doesn't believe in mummy curses, but that she does believe in mummy blessings and in making a friend in the land of the dead. And I wanna take some time to thank all of these people who have helped me uh, with this project. Okay, so that's it for me. Next up is Alice Stevenson. She is Associate Professor of Museum Studies at UCL Institute of Archaeology. She has previously held positions as curator of the Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology and researcher in world archaeology at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Okay, hey, thank you very much indeed. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, just some of the usual ethical justifications that are given for the study of mummified Egyptian human remains in museums. Um, let's see how we move on. Here we go. Um, one of the things that is so striking about um, Egyptian human mummified remains um, is how they are so prolific in public institutions across the UK. The public can encounter them in so many different places and I think that fact alone should shock us um, but it doesn't. Um, so why? Uh, well part of the answer I think is because of um, a well-known phenomenon about when material enters into a museum it's subject to something called the museum effect whereby that that uh, object, specimen, human, um, is isolated from the world, it's offered up for attentive looking and transformed into art like our own. But the problem is, I think that in the case of Egypt, and particularly with human remains, this effect has been so profound um, that, it, that it's unsettling, I think. The public expect to see mummies in the in the museum the egyptian mummies have become the museum they are a symbol of the museum and this is just one example among many this is um the guardian newspaper and it was just a column about how the high street is dying and being consigned to the museum and the illustration is a generic illustration but to kind of convey that sense of a museum there you can see uh, the egyptian coffin to the right um and even you know, if you go to somewhere like the British Museum and you enter the Great Court, there's a banner that's sort of uh, a promise to the people entering the museum of all the things they're going to see in the British Museum. And the first thing on that list is mummies. The last thing, ancient Egypt. So really it bookends everything else in the institution. And again, another thing that I find very striking is that in um, the history of um, the World in 100 Objects, that very successful radio program that uh, went out about 10 years ago, the very first object chosen is a human remains. And it's the, the mummy of Hornegetef. 
Um, and I think this is very, very telling. What is the appeal? Um, well, for almost two centuries, these sorts of displays have encouraged a process of, of, of othering. It's a double process. They are exotic, they are the other, yet at the same time, they've been assimilated. Um, they are seen to be speaking to our shared humanity. Um, and actually, this is why, explicitly why, Hernegetev was chosen by Neil McGregor to open up the history of the entire world, because he thought that would be the ideal departure point um, for talking about us. And that, that brings me to the first ethical justification that's often um, given for doing studies on mummies, that in doing such a study, you can give back humanity to these individuals. You can provide more, indivi more information, about how they lived, um, who they were, and that, that all sounds very compelling, but it assumes that scientific study is itself neutral and not informed by operationalized in the present. Now, Christina Riggs has already been mentioned and her work really uh, is quite vital in this context. Um, so in response to something like what Neil McGregor narrated for uh, this program, Christina Riggs would say, to impose modern sensibilities onto ancient society implies that shared humanity equates to shared cultural values. It does not. And she goes on to say that the complexity of how past and present are intertwined is one of the legacies with which the object world endows us. And I want to pick up on this, uh, this last bit here about the complexity of past and present because it's not just a distant ancient past, ancient Egypt, there are multiple pasts, including the more recent centuries of exploitation, such as the one that's just been narrated so powerfully by Charlotte. Exploitation, violation, appropriation of what were once sacred entities. And so people like Angela Stein and Christina Riggs and others have been at pains to, to, to point out um, that this includes, this, this, this recent past includes racist ideologies that underpinned unwrapping um, and it also has left us with legacies and language around which these sorts of human remains are still entrenched today. And it's these sorts of stereotypes, um, like we've seen in the previous presentation, those are dehumanizing. And so I'd say that actually, if we want to be giving back humanity to these individuals, that requires an active process of addressing directly those stereotypes. Another common ethical justification for why you want to study and display human remains um, is that it's fine to do so, but do so within historical context. But which one? Usually museums emphasize, again, the ancient past, you know, the, the ancient rites um, and what these, um, you know, what mummification might have meant in ancient Egypt. Um, but what about the much more recent past that informs and frames that interpretation? So one of the questions that we were asked to consider in this panel um, is, you know, why should we study colonial histories? And I'd say it's because it's not just the backdrop. It informs how we talk about these remains, and it absolutely informs public expectations, how the public receive and engage with, um, with them. Now, I've also seen um, recently a justification for the display and for the approach taken to um, studying uh, human remains on the basis that there was public consultation. Um, but which publics, um, on what basis, and it's often not clear what that consultation has involved, what sorts of information are being provided for the public to, to comment. Um, and I think that returns to another question that we've asked in this panel, which is who decides? And I'd actually say we need to qualify that question further. Who decides and on, on, on what basis? And so I'd argue that this is where museum policies, best practice rhetoric, and ethical guidelines shall, shall fall short, um, because ethics is instrumentalized as a sort of um, technical device that allows business as usual. And of course, this is nowhere more evident than 
the final uh, ethical justification I want to just flag up here, which is that studies need to be conducted respectfully. Um, but of course, respect, as we now, well know, is relative. It's a mutable concept, respectful to who or what values. In answering these, I've always found Janet Marstein's work on this. And so Debbie Chalice many years ago pointed me in the direction of this uh, chapter by Janet Marstein, and I use it everywhere, left, right, center. People are probably sick of me talking about it. Um, but what's interesting I find is that Marstein has emphasized the situational and contingent nature of ethics. It is contingent on historical circumstances that are not divorced from present issues. It emphasizes cultural context, including different communities where mummified remains may provoke very different reactions. But I particularly like her idea of radical transparency, which is a mode of communication that allows accountability. In this framework, it's, it's not that you're going to make, um, you know, ethical decisions transparent, you know, hey, we're going we're gonna to study this mummy, it's going to help us understand them, give us, you know, more insight into the ancient past, is that okay? Um, it's to help people see through those decisions. Um, so a transparent approach um, here might say, you know, human remains in museums, yeah, they're, they're controversial, we're, we're going to admit that. But a radically transparent approach um, would be one that would articulate specifically why. It would make explicit the histories of collection under colonial conditions. It would look at the examination of these remains, which have often happened under racist thinking. And that should be clear in any consultation. So to conclude, I would argue that there's really not enough specific guidance for museums on how to confront the histories through which scientific studies of mummies per se have been uh, conducted because one of the things is that the that we're not very good at communicating to the public who are already primed to receive um, stories about mummies in particular ways so a museum may say that it has, has evaluated a scientific study ethically that it's been respectful um, and it's going to tell us more about the ancient individual but the fact is these studies enter a public realm which has been primed by several centuries of sensationalism and by the museum effect that has profoundly domesticated Egypt. Museums are in the business of communication and I think they should be better equipped to shape and support how the messages about these remains are being constructed. And when I say museums, I just want to finally qualify that we need to remember these are very complex institutions. We're not just talking um, about singular monoliths. So when we think about display and study, we might think about um, the single author, the, the, the agency of a single curator, but museums are made of all sorts of competing demands and departments, marketing, management, the shop, conservation, design. Who is writing the press releases? Um, we need to be thinking holistically about how human remains are talked about in every aspect of museum work, because you could do a respectful, multi-vocal display, but that's not going to help if the museum shop is then selling mummy kitsch um, and tomb robbing games um, and books in which uh, ancient Egyptians are perceived or are shown as white, which they, they certainly were not. So my final point would be we're so used to seeing mummified human remains in museums, but museums are often blind to how they have produced ways of seeing them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alice. That was very interesting. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Heba abdel -Gawed. She is an Egyptian Egyptologist and the postdoctoral researcher for Egypt's Dispersed Heritage Project, which she's working on with Alice. She has pre previously held various curatorial roles in the UK, and she specializes in the history of Egyptian archaeology, focusing on the modern Egyptian perceptions and representations of the collection and distribution of archaeological finds from Egypt to the world. So I don't know if have I here. Hope she is. She had some Wi-Fi issues earlier. Oh, there she is. You're muted.
Hi, everyone. I might just uh, totally go off. And if I did. of uh, Wi-Fi and connectivity. So if you lose me, um, I'll do my best to try to reconnect once again. Um, so we're losing you a bit, but then it comes back, so. Haba, can you hear me? I guess, well, maybe we should do, we should go with the next speaker first and then come back to Heba. Hopefully her Wi-Fi situation will be better by then. So I'm just gonna, yeah, okay. Yes. So the next speaker would be uh, Sanchita Balachandran. She is Associate Director of the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum and Senior Lecturer in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Johns Hopkins University. In her current role, she conducts research of the research of the Archaeological Museum's collection and teaches courses related to the technical study and analysis of ancient objects and the history, ethics, and practice of art conservation. She, uh, she received her graduate training in, as a conservator specializing in archaeological materials at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. Great. Um, I completely understand the difficulty of internet it, here in Baltimore. It's also a problem in my attic. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, will you let me know, shout out, if you can see my PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah, we're seeing it. It's great. Perfect. Uh, and again, in case anything happens with my internet, um, I'm giving you the full text of my remarks here. Um, so you should be able to actually see my remarks in case I temporarily disappear. Uh, so I want to start by thanking Charlotte and Catherine for the invitation to be part of the panel and to all my co-panelists and to the EES for supporting this conversation. Uh, and I'm going to read uh, my talk because I'm very old school and I like paper. Uh, so my name is Sanchita Balachandran. I'm a conservator of archaeological materials and associate director of the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum. And I'm speaking to you from Baltimore, or a place now called Baltimore, but that is the ancestral homeland of the Susquehannock people. I also acknowledge the presence of the Piscataway, the Accahannocks, the Nanticokes, the Lumbees, and the Cherokees. And I want to thank Peggy Maynard of the Multicultural Initiative for Community Advancement for helping me begin the work of learning the indigenous histories of this place I call home. For those of you who may not be able to see me, I'm a brown skinned woman of South Asian descent. I have shoulder length curly black hair and I'm wearing a red shirt. I'm sitting in my attic and behind me are bookshelves and some of my children's artwork. Um, I cannot speak about preserving human remains in abstract. Uh, everything I can say is the result of my experience and relationship with four specific people with whom I've spent periods of time as I conserved and cared for their bodies in different ways. The next slide shows a photograph and digital depictions of these three people, of three of these people, excuse me. Uh, I'm not showing you the skeletal remains of a young child of indeterminate biological sex excavated at the Abydos North Cemetery in Egypt, uh, whose burial is dated to King Aha of the First Dynasty. But you are seeing facial depictions of two ancient Egyptian women now in the care of the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum, completed by our colleagues at Face Lab, Liverpool, John Moores University, under the direction of Caroline Wilkinson and with the expertise of Catherine Smith and Mark Ruffley. These images are the result of a 2016 2018 collaboration between Face Lab uh, and our museum with essential contributions of Egyptologist Meg Sweeney and assistant curator Kate Gallagher. Uh, the woman on the left is known as the Goucher mummy for Reverend John Goucher, who purchased her in Cairo in 1895. And based on recent digital imaging, the individual on the right may have been named Amanirdis, and she was purchased in current day Luxor in 1832. 
You also see a photograph of Catholic Saint, Saint Marianne on the right, though not ancient or Egyptian, conserving Saint Marianne's relics and being in conversation with the Catholic authorities responsible for her care has impacted my thinking about how we might care for the ancient Egyptian dead. I'll make a few observations about the care of human remains from my own perspective as an archeological conservator and also as an educator and museum worker. And in the following slides, I will be using the terms our and we to describe contemporary people working in conservation, archeology, span museum studies, and other associated fields. First, our professional practices normalize the dehumanization of other people's ancestors. The first time I encountered the bodies of someone else's ancestors were in museum storage and subsequently on field excavations. I still remember the initial sense of shock and disbelief that these were real human beings. We were either disturbing from their rest or that they had been put in a box or placed on a shelf in some nondescript room, often surrounded by other bodies. Under any other circumstances, the keeping of this many mutilated and unclaimed bodies would either be a morgue or a crime scene. But for us, these spaces are collections or research, pieces of people for whom, from whom we intend to extract information or knowledge, even as they can no longer give us their consent to do so. And what happens if you stay in the archaeology museum fields very long is that this kind of encounter with other people's dead becomes entirely normalized as professional practice, as necessary for the discovery and scientific work, essential to our own promotion and credentialing, even as the elevation of our own status further reduces the status of the people we work with to less than human. I say this with full awareness that I too have been caught up in this and have benefited from the authority to make decisions that harm other people's ancestors. Two, our forms of care can cause harm. As a conservator, I was trained as a materials expert, learning the properties and deterioration phenomena of stone, ceramics, bone, skin. I learned to take apart and reassemble these materials to choose adhesives and other substances that would be compatible with them from a physical and chemical perspective. But conservators know that the treatments and materials we use may prove inappropriate or even harmful over time and impossible to remove without greater damage. And utilizing these same materials on human remains is far more fraught. We are coming to terms with past practices such as the routine application of pesticides to objects that are now difficult to remove and which pose health threats when repatriated back to originating communities who wish to use them. The chemicals and detergents we have used to consolidate and clean surfaces are contaminants to some originating communities. Even the storage of human beings in plastic films or foams can be considered suffocating for some descendant communities. The mixing of the dead of different communities in storage can be disrespectful and the handling of remains by those without the appropriate cultural privileges and authority can be dangerous. In all of these cases, our highest standards of care may significantly increase the harm already done to these people. Being in the position to be of authority to be caregivers also means someone else's care, that of kin or descendants is not possible or even actively denied. This too is a source of pain, and for all of our good intentions, we perpetuate its continuance. Three, we primarily benefit from the care of the ancient dead. Why do we perform care on the ancient dead after our own practices have desecrated their burials and bodies? Many of us are invested in doing the right thing, but our care often benefits us more than the deceased people who are the supposed beneficiaries. One justification already mentioned, um, often given for studying ancient human remains is that there's an inherent scientific value in doing so, and that the knowledge learned from science benefits us all in some way. I myself have balked at physically removing pieces, hair, fingernails, DNA in its various forms from these ancient people because of my concern about not having their consent to do so. But I have also justified so-called non-invasive studies, such as x-radiography, CT scanning, laser scanning, for the information they can provide. In the 2016-18 study I chose, albeit with some concern, these techniques which digitally sliced up these individuals' most intimate information into bits of data and then shared them with our team of researchers in my own pursuit of knowledge. I did this despite the insistence of indigenous scholars and writers who have reminded us again and again that their ancestors, anyone's ancestors, are not a resource. They are human beings. In the past few years, as I have read and assigned more indigenous writing and scholarship in my own teaching, um, and if you look at the, um, the 
uh, the document that was shared, I have a few references. I'm very aware that any care that prioritizes our benefit alone is evidence of our continued investment in colonial practices. The only ethical response is to strive to be in relationship with people, past, present, and future, in more reciprocal ways. Four, our restorative acts of rehumanizing ancient people still retell the story of their dehumanization. Even as we attempt restorative acts, exhibitions, publications, talks such as this, as ways to tell fuller stories of the ancient people we now care for, we have to acknowledge that we cannot truly go back to the point before the violence that resulted in these individuals now being in our care. Further, that violence is often the only tangible form of information we have. For example, in the form of acquisition letters, journal descriptions, or receipts of purchase. And these people's bodies are also marked by this violence. When I conserved the Goucher mummy, I had to concede that there was no way to relay the large piece of linen that once covered the entire front of her body because it had been torn away in prior attempts to unwrap her. So I could only preserve the evidence of that earlier violation. Even powerful moments of recovery are tinged with loss. For example, multiband imaging of the seemingly blank part of the foot of the coffin here um, from the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum recovered a name that glows in visible infrared luminescence because it was painted in Egyptian blue. This gave us back a name, Amenirdis, presumably this woman's name, but we cannot be sure. In recently rereading historian Sadia Hartman's Venus in Two Acts, I was struck by her anguish over how recovering the story of an enslaved African girl named in a slave ship's ledger couldn't help but retell the violence of her capture and erasure. Reading Hartman, I'm struck now by how there is no purely restorative act. What we can do is simply examine the conditions that made the existing story possible with all the honesty we are capable of and to acknowledge that our work will never be enough or finished. Five, worry can be a form of care. As professional conservators, we are expected to finish a project and move on, but we spend time with the items we conserve, learning their surfaces intimately, becoming emotionally invested in them. I worry about the things I have conserved. I visit them on exhibition in other museums to say hello and ask after them. I take pictures of them and keep them as remembrances. We remain in relationship. I've been thinking about my insistence on producing facial depictions for the two individuals at the archeological museum. Why did I need pictures of people I could visit every day? Uh, Egyptologist Meg Sweeney and I talked a lot about what these women would look like. And our face lab colleagues had told us that their approach was to make these depictions recognizable to us as contemporary people. And that while the depictions would be based on robust scientific concepts and data sets, there were things we could not know because there was no data for them. The shapes of the nose, the ears, uh, what the hair looked like, the skin tone, wrinkles. Uh, we therefore had to acknowledge this in our interpretations. And even knowing all of this, the first time I saw these depictions, I was struck by a jolt of recognition that I somehow knew these people. Now, I am aware that these images met my own selfish need to know them, but why did I need to do that through this pictorial interface? Uh, the next slide shows a photograph and facial depictions again. Devout Catholics who pray to St. Marianne, whom I've mentioned before, for her intercession can purchase portable prayer cards with her photographs on them. And a recent video by Yul New Artist Miarka Media describes how remixed cell phone images of members of their community circulate through text messages on the internet as ways of connecting, remembering, mourning, and worrying. Is this why I need images of these ancestors who are not my ancestors? Do I need images of them as a way of worrying about them? worrying about my own work with them? Could worrying then, a decades long worrying about specific people we are in relationship with also be a form of care as much as sitting with their remains for a while might be? Perhaps. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sanchita. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and hear from Ahmed and then we'll go to Heba last so that hopefully her Wi-Fi issues are sorted out by then. So our next speaker is going to be, I'm just looking for the bio, just a second. Okay, so our next, our last speaker is, our next speaker is Ahmed El Garabli. He is a fifth year medical student at Imperial College London. During the course he is 
During the course, he has taken a special interest in medical humanities, ethics, and law, and has undertaken a research project focused on the ethics of the use of human remains within the museum sector. So, there you go. Thank you to everyone who's, uh, who's spoken so far. Uh, no PowerPoint for me, so you will have to bear with me with my voice for about 10 minutes, but hopefully I'll be able to paint a picture for you through what I say. Uh, so let's start off. Human remains have a very peculiar and unique situation historically and in terms of our model in, uh, modern interactions. But the ethics shaping these interactions with this material have been very fluid and changing over time. We could probably talk for weeks about human remains and the different ways that they've been interacted with over time and whether that's ethical or it isn't. But there's an immense amount of literature out there already discerning, uh, concerning this topic. What there is significantly less literature about is the different disciplines that interact with human remains themselves. And, uh, everyone or the majority of people within this talk right now will be coming at this from a museum perspective or an archaeological perspective, but I want to introduce something a little bit different to you guys today and a completely different domain that looks also looks significantly at human remains and that is medicine. So I'm a fifth year medical student studying at Imperial College London. I also studied uh, philosophy, humanities and law, and that's why I've taken an interest in ethics. And one of the key questions that I pose to myself being an Egyptian who's studying in London, where we have the British Museum, is why is it that mummies that are displayed in, in uh, museums that we we love so much that form a part of our national identity. Why are they treated in a certain way, which is completely different to the way that we treat human remains and human bodies within a medical context? And that question really puzzled me. Uh, we want to delve a little bit further into that. But before we get into that, uh, Janet Marstein, who um, Pro, uh, Professor Alice has already uh, quoted and spoken a lot about, mentioned that no single story is pertinent, but together they constitute a reality. And that was my biggest motivation that formed this project was about trying to bring together these different perspectives and trying to assimilate one sort of wholesome perspective on how we treat human remains that is ethical, that is just, that fits our modern day narrative and our perspective. <laughs> So if you allow me to take you into the dissection room, then follow me. This is probably somewhere where there are a very small percentage, or in fact, none of you have ever been before. So coming from a medical background, death has always looked one certain way. It's that people come, they live, and then most people get ill, and then they end up in hospital, and then they die either in hospital or at home. And then there's a funeral, and then they end up being buried or cremated or uh, whatever kind of religious, cultural, spiritual process that they have for death. And that seems to be the end. There's also a subsect of people uh, in the Western world within the UK who choose to donate their body to science. And then this donated body follows a completely different trajectory. It undergoes a series of treatments to drain the body of its fluids, the blood, etc. And then it undergoes a series of treatments to make that body something that can be preserved, usually with formaldehyde. And then you get something that looks a little bit like a human, uh, something that looks a little bit different. It's like a human that's lost all of its human characteristics. The body is there, but the body feels a little bit yellow and leathery and different. Uh, it is the closest thing that we get to a real human being, but on first interaction, you don't really get the sense that it is a true human being. There's something different about it. The physical interaction is there, but there is definitely something different. The body is always covered in a bag and there's a sheet that covers this body full of chemicals to help in its preservation. When we come to interact in, the, in our dissection and our studies, we only uncover the piece of the body that we are going to learn from or that we're going to examine. And that is a form of respect. Now, for lay people at the age of 18, when we're both entering medical school, most of us are lucky enough to never have experienced death in our families or to have never seen a dead body. And that's what we think, but the reality is we have seen dead bodies in a completely different context. But there's this complete dissonance with, is this really a dead body or not? And that usually is depicted in mummies or human remains that we see within museums. Before this whole process backed into the medical school setting, they show us videos that allow us to interact with the, with the human beings who have donated their bodies. These humans talk about their motivations for donating their bodies to science. Why is it that they've been stimulated to do such a thing? What is their intention in terms of their donation? And then we get perspectives of students who have done dissection before, and they tell us about the things that they've learned. They tell us about the rules and, and the methods of respect and dignity and honesty and discipline that we need when we interact with these, with these uh, cadavers, with these dead bodies. 
um, and you get a perspective from an emotional sense, a human sense, and a scientific sense that develops a wholesome picture of how we need to interact with these bodies in terms of gaining, in terms of the science that we're learning, and in terms of the respect that we owe to the human beings who have told us their story and have told us their motivations as to why they donated their body in the first place. And I emphasize that this is our experience in the UK. I know it will be different in different countries in different areas and different times, but this is what the modern dissection room and dissection for medical students looks like these days. Uh, in a group of eight people or so, six to eight people, we spend two years with the same body. We examine all the different parts of the body. We will break it down and see, see what goes on inside and try and learn the anatomy through our interactions with that body. Respect is emphasized throughout consistently. So we aim to do the minimal amount of cutting. We aim to maintain as much as we possibly can the, the aesthetic appearance of the body. And we aim to only, you, only interact with or use what we are there to benefit from and not anything else or anymore. Uh, we have to be respectful in terms of our interaction, what we say and how we deal with the body as well. And at the end of this all, there is often a burial service where the medical students are invited with the family members of this deceased individual. And we bury that body that we've learned so much from at the end of that process. And I think it forms a wholesome picture of honestly and truth, truthful respect. So, this is, the, this is the process. This is practically a private process, but the process is based on an ethical background. And I'm going to talk you through a couple of main ethical principles that guide that. So the, the, the key thing is medicine has ethical principles and we have to try and weigh these ethical principles together. There's no 100% black and white, right or wrong answer. So medicine has a duty of beneficence to do the most good and non-maleficence to do no harm. So dissection puts us in a position where we have to weigh these things up. Obviously, we get a lot of good from interacting and learning the science and learning the anatomy and also being put in an uncomfortable position when confronting death. Because at the end of the day, our duty is then to go and treat people who are in difficult situations, who are vulnerable. The ill person is not a straightforward thing. Where if we're going to then have to do surgery in the future, if we're going to have to go down this career path where, where it feels like we are... We are, we are doing something wrong to the body, you know, where you have to break it down. You need a background or you need a first introduction, which you kind of get from dissection. That's the, that's the beneficence, that's the good. At the same time, there's a harm. There is definitely a harm. It's not often the case that we will break it down perfectly and be able to maintain the, the, aesthetic, the aesthetic appearance. Uh, there is a harm that that, that, that individual is not getting the, uh, the burial or the typical religious ceremony that they might have had straight away. But we are, at the same time, we're respecting their choice. It is definitely a, a way up sort of thing. And the law reflects the ethics that bases this, uh, these medical decisions in the sense that the Human Tissue Act makes us stipulate consent. So we have to have asked permission from these individuals for the donation. We have to stipulate how long we're going to keep the body for. And we're going to, we have to stipulate what we're going to do with the, what, exactly what we're going to do with the body and what we're going to do with it when our, our period of learning is finished and how we're going, to, we're going to arrange the burial, arrange the procedure. So there is a stringent process both in ethics and in law within medicine that guides our interaction with these human remains. And that is based on duty, responsibility, beneficence, non-maleficence, and ultimately respect. Historically, however, the, the dissection was used as a form of punishment for vilifying criminals. And medicine has had to contend with that as, as the, that shaped our public understanding of dissection and our modern understanding of dissection and of learning and of benefit. And, it, that further adds to our duty of respect and candor and, and, uh, and the duty towards these patients to try and heal those negative perceptions of dissection in the past and present a much more positive version in the modern day. Well, so why is this relevant to archaeology? Why is it relevant to museums at all? Why, is, why, is, why should this be a part of the discussion? Well, in looking at the ethical guidelines that have shaped archaeology, archaeology and museums, they seem on paper to be so, so similar. Archaeological um, accords like the Tamaki, Ma Tamaki Makurao Accord stipulates the need for continuous consultation with communities regarding culturally appropriate display. So that would be in essence continually interacting with uh, the patients and the patient family to do something that is respectful in terms of our interaction with the human remains. 
there seems to be similarities. Uh, museums also stipulate respect, cultural, religious, and spiritual concerns in terms of the way that we deal with these human remains. So why is it that then objectively, when we look at these ethical frameworks that have guided interaction, they seem very similar on paper, but then in practice, the way that we treat human remains within a museum or an archeological setting is so completely different to the way that we treat a, a human remain within that medical setting. And I wanted to apply these perspectives to two very pertinent case studies, if you'll bear with me. So I'm not sure if many of you know, there's something called the Granville Box, which is held in the, in the British Museum right now. So Granville was actually a, a surgeon. And in 1821, he dissected ancient Egyptian mummies to try and find out the racial origin of these mummies. So a lot of talks have already spoken about the inherent racism and colonialism within, within the, the studies of the mummies. But this is a very pertinent example because this box is full of four arms and four legs from different, different mummies. It has some human fetuses in it. And if you actually take in the words that I'm saying, surely it fills you with shock that these things have been put in a box for display or the, the original purpose was for display in the in the in the personal collection of granville and then in the british museum when it was acquired in 1853 after it was acquired, Granville was disappointed because the box wasn't displayed in a manner that was uh, adapted best for the instruction and the amusement of the public. So imagine Granville, an eminent surgeon at the time, was upset that people were not able to interact and see this box. It kind of fills us with a sense of kind of shock and for me, and it makes me a little bit angry reading this, like, to think that that, that was actually a motivation for an individual and that there was no respect, no dignity. And for someone coming from a medical profession as well, all these things that we hold so close to our hearts to see, like literally within the last 200 years, that ethics is, is, has been so different is, uh, is quite shocking. But here, the pure motivation around the presentation of these human remains was cultural capital. So Susan Pierce suggests that the material conveys famous Im immortality. This is because the donor, Granville, maintains a symbolic ownership, although, like, although he's donated or sold uh, this material to the British Museum, he symbolically owns it. And he gains a sort of like modern day we call it clout or in in the past you call it like a cultural capital you get a respect you get the reverence and the the uh the adoration of his peers within within his uh, his sector um and annette wiener describes it as keeping whilst giving so here although like the material is is given to the institution for learning for educating the public for for interaction the reality is is for his, the primary motivation is for his own kind of prestige and benefit and that completely counteracts both the ethical um, uh, kind of accords and the ethical principles of archaeology archaeology and museums and secondly of medicine and you may be then thinking, oh, well, this is 200 years ago. Well, like, why is this relevant now? The relevance is, is that this box is still held in storage and within the British Museum. And that is something that should be deeply concerning to, to everyone here. And then the second example is a much more modern example. It's Nesumen. So I'm sure you've all heard of Nesumen. This, and if you haven't, this, this is a mummy where they attempted to recreate the vocal cord through CT constructions. And the, 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 this study concluded that uh, the vocal cord and the vowel sounds that were created from this vocal cord were very similar to modern individuals. So I'm not sure if you're convinced by that conclusion or what your own personal views on, on whether this uh, scientific research was necessarily or relevant. But to me, it harks to some of the, the kind of contentions that have existed within the Granville box back in the day. And it doesn't really show that much progression for me uh, in the modern day. And I'm going to go into, into why. So um, the, 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 med the, the medical professionals and the museum professionals who were involved in this research justified it because they said uh, Nesumen's inscriptions within his uh, funerary text stated that he had a wish to see and address the gods in the future. And this was coupled from a, from a typical citation uh, within ancient Egyptian funerary texts that, that say to speak the name of the dead is to make them live again. And this was used as a justification to try and recreate the vocal cord. Right. So undeniably, the concept of hearing a mummy's voice to, to most lay public or individuals um, makes people incredibly excited. It's definitely going to bring people through the doors to come and see and understand this material. 
But the questionable side is that, firstly, it seems like a very weak extrapolation of funerary texts and what Lesiaman would have wanted, because when you balance the fact that, yeah, it may, it may have said this in his funerary text, and our ancient Egyptian uh, under like, our belief of ancient Egyptian uh, like positive or good deaths was to be consecrated in the land of Egypt and not to, like for, 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 uh, for a mummy to be removed from their coffin to be put on display would be seen as an incredible violation of their, of their wishes. Like what they're presenting in their research is just one side and a complete ignorance of the other side. And I think like if you, if you analyze it from a medical perspective, that's poor research. And if you analyze it from an ethical perspective, it's not, it's not really showing both sides. And I think that's what makes it ethically uh, difficult to, to fully back. And when we look at Granville, or like, although physical dismemberment of bodies has, has considerably stopped, dissection of mummies has, has largely stopped, that we have found new ways through technology to dismember the bodies through CT scanning and things that, that are largely, largely sensational. Because if you actually look at CT scanning in terms of mummies, there exists a, a, a lot of uh, kind of trial and error, which they mentioned within their study, and estimation, which again they mentioned within their study, which then gives us a whole picture of why is this relevant and what is this actually teaching us and what is the balance between our duty of respect and beneficence of doing good and uh, of, of like trying to minimize the harm that we're causing and I think well, our balance is, is a bit off. So in conclusion what have we learned from discussing medicine, from discussing museums, from discussing archaeology and discussing a little bit about these case studies? Well there was two questions that we were asked to discuss, major questions about the panel within this panel. So how do we confront the difficulties of the past in terms of interacting with human remains? And secondly, how do we decide and who gets to decide what we do with human remains to fulfill our ethical obligations and to do the most good? And I think what, we, what museums can truly learn from medicine is the art of letting go. Like, I spoke very in detail about dissection and how we had to stipulate what our purpose was and what we would do with the, exactly what we would do with the body and finally what we would do when, when our time with that body finishes and what museums are still lacking is that concept of what do we do when our time with that body or that human material finishes because human because museums have completely transgressed that there is no finishing point there is no time where we stop and we say okay that's enough we've learned what we needed to learn we've interacted we've gained from this and, we, and now now is the time that we lay these bodies to rest or we do what is right for these bodies based on what we the incredible amount of literature we know what ancient egyptians would have wanted in terms of their their ending and their, their finale and we like to deal with the history and the problematic nature of the past what we can do is put it to an end we can say, look, we've learned, like, there's a wealth of knowledge, there's a little wealth of technological ways that we can present the information that we've learned now, but the material doesn't need to be there. And there will be continuous new discoveries of material too. So to develop a cycle where we can actually say, now is the time to stop, is I think the solution. And that is the one thing that we can truly learn from medicine within the museum sector. I know this may be contentious, I know it's, it probably goes against what a lot of conservators, what a lot of museum professionals and archaeologists have dedicated their life towards, but I think it is something that is ethical, respectful, and will allow us to gain way more from our interactions with the human material because we know it's not, it's not there forever. It can't be shipped to different countries and presented to different people like at whim. And, and you, you then, when you go and see this material, you know it's not going to be there forever. So you benefit so much more from those interactions. I'm more than happy to take questions and and disagreements and comments, but thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ahmed. This was this is a perspective that we don't hear often. And one of my friends texted me during the your talk and she said, medical ethics are progressing faster than our profession's weak imitation of them. I think that's that's correct. Um, so our last speaker. And our last speaker is Heba abdel -Gawed. I'm just, oh, well, I did read her bio before, so I guess we can just go ahead with her presentation. Okay, so here I am. I've managed to defy uh, Petrie's curse, as I almost tell Charlotte, something to go against the, the famous mommy curse. Now, I think every time um, I'm on a panel discussing 
um, the colonial legacies of Egyptology, I end up having huge Wi-Fi issues. So I called it from, from since the ES event, it's Petrie's curse. And it, it was Petrie's curse today as well. Um, I think that like all the fascination, that, like the extremely fascinating talks that we've listened to so far, and I don't know um, what, what if there is anything I can truly bring to the discussion now after listening to everyone, but um, I'll try and do my best. So I've shared my screen. If um, is it? If Charlotte can tell me if it, it is it working fine? It, is it shared? It's okay. Working. So I'm Perfect. seeing your PowerPoint now, not just the slide. Okay. So. It should work fine now, I hope. Yeah, I think it's coming. Things are a bit slow in this part of the world. Yeah, there we go, here it is. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Oops, it has stopped. Um, I, I think it's something to do with the controls. It's not, it has nothing to do with my own internet this time. Do, do you wanna start sharing again? I'll share again, okay. Yeah, that, that's PG's curse again, everyone. <laughs> Is it doing something? Yeah, it is. Um, maybe I can just <laughs> start to talk by the time. Yeah, it, it might take some time. So I might just uh, say a few words by the time, like, uh, the PowerPoint hopefully kicks in at some point. Okay. Um, okay. So I guess that the, the, the perspective, or not the perspective, um, that I'm trying to bring today, or I'm not even trying to bring, I'm just um, amplifying, I'm being the absolute mediator here. Uh, because I think what, what is missing from the discussions, um, not, not just today's panel, but usually when um, anything that has to do with ancient Egypt in general, but particularly when it comes to human remains, is um, where are the Egyptians, the modern Egyptians from the conversation? And it does upset me how that sometimes um, in our um, fight to bring social justice to the past, to the ancient Egyptian human remains, we end up bringing injustice to the living Egyptians by totally ignoring and uh, perhaps isolating them from the discussion. So what we've been doing at um, the Egypt's dispersed heritage uh, is that we've been trying as much as we can to readdress this um, missing voice or perhaps uh, re recenter the Egyptian voices into the conversation. Just I'm trying. The PowerPoint is there, but it won't get shared again. Do you want to? Do you want to send it to me, and then I can screen share from my? Do you think that would work? Oh, it seems to be screen sharing now. Oh, it's working. Is it? Yeah. So now I can see all your slides, but the first one selected. So maybe you should just do it that way. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah. here, here we go. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll skip it a bit because, and that, that, was, that was really why when, when we were discussing the session, Charlotte and myself, and then we were, when we were thinking of a title, the title that we chose, well, we hope it was catchy, but the reason why was not that it was just to be something to be catchy, but it just, there is always uh, this talk about mummies, mummies, and then we tend to ignore how uh, the, the museum's mummies or even Egyptology's mummies are someone else's ancestors, as Sanchita was saying uh, perfectly earlier. And even in today's discussions of the need of having an ethical uh, review of how ancient Egyptians are presented, displayed, or researched, again, um, the modern Egyptian voices tend to be absolutely dismissed. And sometimes the, the, the solution or the quick fix that um, modern um, Western academia or Egyptology as a discipline or those who are confronting or critiquing the history of archaeology, the quick fix that they tend to seek is uh, bringing someone, I would say, like myself, for example, on a panel like today, 
uh, and trying to give my opinion as representative of um, Egypt's opinion. But uh, this is equally, I would say, unjust, if not as well racist, because at the end of the day, um, singling out a whole 100 million society into one person um, is, is again racism. And the fact that this belongs to everyone, and at the end of the day, I'm just a member of the community of practice, and my, I do have my own biases being an Egyptologist or as an archaeologist. So what we were trying to do at the Egypt's Dispersed Heritage is finding a way where we can, uh, first of all, remind everyone that be it the human remains or the objects that, are from, uh, that come from ancient Egypt and that are now dispersed all over the world and hosted by a variety of Western museums or international museums, um, they are equally displaced human beings. The human remains, particularly, they are displaced, dislocated, and perhaps dispossessed human, like dispossessed human beings. They were enforced into um, immigration, let's say, from Egypt to elsewhere around the world. And it's something that um, I don't know. I don't know the reason, but even when we get to confront um, the biases or the colonial legacies of ancient Egyptian human remains, even if we try to do it ethically, we tend to equally ignore the fact of how. They are still. They were. They left. Um, they left Egypt without being asked. They were. They were forced out of Egypt. The one disclaimer that I want to bring today is that um, in trying to bring the Egyptian voices into the conversation, this is not by any means to prove uh, or to say that we are. I'm trying to emphasize that uh, the Egyptians are the descendants of the ancient Egyptians because I believe that this is for the modern Egyptians to decide. I'm like even us putting emphasis on the Egyptians being connected to the ancient Egyptians or not, I think it's equally racist and it's equally part of the persisting colonial legacy as well. So this is not by any means um, making any emphasis of how the Egyptians perceive themselves. It has to be up to the Egyptians to do it. And when it comes to human remains, I think uh, Fayoum brings us um, an amazing example of how Egyptians tend to interact with their uh, predecessors and their human remains in the ways that are significant to them, be it in producing products or in, in having uh, some mugs with Fayoum portraits or in trying to revive them on the walls. Um, this is how people interact with their ancestors. There are a variety of ways uh, for the people to do this. And um, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be, I, I would say, we, we shouldn't be limiting how the people perceive themselves. And we shouldn't be limiting what do we mean by having ancestral links. Because what I want to show today from the responses that we've been getting from the Egyptian communities that this is above all um, emotional. The links that you make with your past or the links that you make with your ancestors um, has to do more with emotions than it has to do with race. And that brings us again to the Western biases and the need to shift uh, our perception from um, what, do, what do we mean by a clean line of continuity in communities. And this can again be a way to defy how Egyptian human remains are perceived as uncontested and unclaimed because as we, we would see in Fayoum, like that's totally not the case. They are equally claimed and they are absolutely uh, contested as we see on the walls of Fayoum. And I have to thank uh, Mahmoud from Fayoum for um, sharing those images with us. And Mahmoud, Mahmoud is one of um, the community partners who's, who would be working with us on the Egypt's Dispersed Heritage pro uh, Project in uh, trying to find ways of, um, I wouldn't say engaging, but in working together with the Fayoum community in finding how they would best perhaps amplify their voices in wider Egyptological discussions and equally in displays of Fayoum portraits in museums, be it in Egypt or in Western museums, because they tend to have um, interesting, um, like interesting perceptions of what a Fayoum portrait is that goes beyond the way we perceive it in Egyptology as we always get stuck in trying to think where they Greeks, where they Roman, where they Egyptian, but it seems that the Fayoumis are actually beyond uh, this discussion, and thanks to Mahmoud and uh, the, the, the like, the really interesting uh, like engagements that I've I've been having with him, and I'm looking forward to working with him closely uh, on this. What we were trying to do, or what we are thinking in, um, how can we center the Egyptian communities in discussions like the one we're having today, like the panel that we're having today, and how this centering shouldn't be um, only a tick boxing exercise, or shouldn't be just um, including voices in just for us to feel that we've done our part and we're, we're doing things ethically, but in a way that can contribute to their own lives or in a way that can offer them some sort of service. 
And I think that including them in the conversation to begin with, this in itself is uh, bringing social justice to communities who have been for long uh, dismissed from the conversation. One way of doing it is trying to find um, ways of how such discussions or how perhaps uh, confronting or uh, challenging the colonial legacies is by doing it in a way that can respond to communities' needs and expectations. So we started to think of ways of how we can do this, how we can center this diversity of voices, like uh, I wouldn't say the 100 million, but at least representatives uh, of the various uh, strands of community groups that we have in Egypt. How can we do it in a way that we can make sure that the Egyptian voices from, from now on are equally amplified in discussions and decisions of how Egyptian heritage is presented and perceived, be it in, in museums or be it in um, the archaeological practice at large. So we thought initially of social media. Social media uh, is heavily used in Egypt and that explains why my, my Wi-Fi tends to break all the time. Everyone is on the internet and everyone is on the internet using social media and we're one of, uh, we've got the highest uh, usage uh, percentage among it, like in the world. Not only because we've, we're, we've got one of the highest populations in the world, but that uh, that that is again because the percentage of use is quite high and it tends to be falling uh, within the majority of Egypt's population and it's quite representative not only of the age groups but equally of uh, the variant uh, social groups within Egypt so it could be a good uh, a good a good means of interacting with the Egypt's multivocality at once and we decided of course uh, if you're in Egypt you have to do something that is funny we are very renowned for our sense of humor and we started working or collaborating with um, a, a set of comic artist, but particularly for the case of human remains or for, for the case of how we can bring in Egyptian voices or the Egyptian communities into debates, but um, in an active way rather than in a passive way where we just introduce them to the facts and, and like pour down information into them, but in a way that they could equally respond and interact with us was to work with comic artists in producing um, comic strips that could be shared online on social media. and. Uh, the main, the main aim or what we were looking for is trying to make those comics both re like relevant and relatable to the Egyptians' um, daily lives, but equally responsive to both the debates that are happening within uh, the sphere of Egyptology, but equally the debates that are happening within Egypt. So we created uh, the Nasser, Heba and uh, Egypt's Dispersed Heritage comic series, where we tend to it's a bi-weekly series where we tend each time we, we pick um, a debate uh, in co-partnership co between me and Nasser, the comic artist, and we discuss it openly with the Egyptians uh, using something that is uh, very relevant to Egypt's sense of humor or to Egypt's punchlines. When it came to human remains, there were three main comics that I think they would be uh, quite relevant to the three main questions that we're asking today, and equally that they would be quite um, I, I don't know if, they would, if I can say eye-opening, but they could contribute to the discussions that we're having in terms of how can we confront these colonial legacies, but not only confront the colonial legacies, but how can we realize the, 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 the present impact of those colonial legacies, because they are still well and alive. Like um, We tend to think of them in the past tense, but sadly they are still persisting and they are still present. And they do have an impact on the communities today. Most of what we're discussing uh, in the panel or most of what has been discussed so far does have a direct impact on uh, the lives of communities and we'll show how. The initial comic and this was uh, our kick out was um, the one that we were just discussing uh, the dispersal of heritage uh, by, uh, by the British, by the, by, by British archaeology, the, the scale and scope of how much uh, British archaeologists have dispersed Egypt's heritage to the world. What was interesting that immediately, the very moment that I would tell this story to anyone, not just Nasser, but even in my family WhatsApp group, which is the main focus group of anything that I do, once I tell them the scale and the scope of how much uh, of ancient Egypt is dispersed all over the world, all of them, they think of, can, can we travel too? Can you wrap us into a mummy and we travel too? So the fact that how, um, or perhaps the irony of how uh, the mummy is are the selling point or the ancient Egyptian humans, uh, be it remains or full bodies, are the selling point of most of the Western museums or, uh, or most of uh, the way the West perceives ancient Egypt. 
while they are very much welcomed into, uh, into the museum sphere, the Egyptians themselves are usually denied access, or the modern Egyptians themselves today are denied access to most of, um, to most of the destinations where those human remains reside today. And the immediate response that we have in the comic, it's exactly the same. It, it was just, the, it was the real dialogue that me and the comic artist had. I, I once, the, the moment I did tell him the scale and scope of this dispersal, his first instance was, can you, can you tell them that there is a new mummy that wants to travel too? This comes from the fact of how we are usually denied visas, we are usually denied access, while uh, our heritage would be very welcomed anywhere around the world and even remains of our ancestors would be very welcomed um, anywhere around the world today, we would be denied access. And um, what, what we've done here is that we're bringing the impact or perhaps the persistence of such colonial legacy to it today. How um, in Victorian times, they were very much fascinated by uh, mummies and um, this was usually on any of the lists of uh, donors, like everyone, everyone wants a mummy. And while everyone would want a mummy, these very same donors or these very same collectors were extremely biased against the modern Egyptian communities then. And sadly today, be it in the immigration laws or be it uh, in uh, the visas laws. This is how we, this is how we try to, to, to wrap the dichotomy, what, what you perceive your mummies and us, the way you perceive ancient Egypt, but the way you perceive us. And it's usually this question of heritage or lives, and we tend to lose whenever this question is posed. Whenever we are in competition with heritage, modern Egyptian communities and perhaps wider uh, Middle Eastern communities um, are usually, we, we usually tend to lose uh, in this battle. And I have to say from the responses uh, that we, we were getting were very powerful and most of like people got it straight away and that was the response of everyone while everything gets to trouble, we are denied access. What we've done here is that uh, we not only are we, we making a reality check to museums to see that the colonial legacies that you speak of in the past tense are very present and they do have an impact, a profound impact on us today and uh, above all emotional impact on the feeling of self-defeat and, and the feeling of uh, being um, minimal to the rest of the world. Um, it's equally a way of how we provided the Egyptians um, a reality check as well of how they, they really need to, to reconsider how much of the heritage protection that we get, uh, to, that, that, that we get usually lectured about. Is, um, is very much fake when it comes to comparisons with lives and something that the recent incident of the Syrian boat in the UK borders says like, uh, makes it very clear. The other fact I think that we wanted to discuss or is how the human remains um, in museums or perhaps in the, tend to be treated as objects. They are objects of studies. Uh, they are something that could be put, in this, uh, put on display for people to admire. And um, interestingly for us, they are not. They are, as I said, they are displaced human beings. They are dislocated and they are equally dispossessed. We've done the same by bringing, uh, making them, uh, making three, <laughs> three coffins uh, lined up in a photo shoot. And in these photo shoot, they were making a discussion between them that would happen between any Egyptian immigrants where they are uh, low paid. And that would usually happen uh, in the Gulf. And that was the reference that we used uh, in our comic in how they would be usually denied holidays. They would be denied leaves. The Egyptians who would immigrate elsewhere like the human, like the human remains that we've got here. And they would be um, equally like, objects of display, they, they, they have no agency. They are usually even, they usually have to hand in their passports to uh, their employer and they are not allowed to leave the country without written permission. And that is exactly the same case with the, with the human remains um, in, in the Western museums today, or even in the Egyptian museums. They are just objects. They have no say in whether, in, they have no say whatsoever in any decisions that are taken uh, within the museum or in, in research and they are um, dehumanized. And the way we try to, to make it relevant, not only to the Egyptians, but equally relevant to the Western museums, so it's something that they can use to provoke discussions in the UK as well, is how we usually tend to make it evidence-based. So the main character that we've got here, which is uh, the female on the right, it's um, a coffin, an inner coffin from the Horniman Museum, which is equally displayed in, in a sense that like uh, the label just had 
an Egyptian mummy and that's it. You don't even need to, to explain more. Like it explains itself, an Egyptian mummy. Like no, no, no more description is needed. This in itself, being an Egyptian and the mummy is enough for fascination. No need to go to delve into details. What we got, the responses that we got people, uh, as I said, again, uh, the Egyptians uh, totally got it. And they started um, equally comment commenting on how this is very relevant to their lives today. And this is very relevant to how like, um, most of them made the, made, made the comment of how human remains are, are like becoming um, an agent of capitalism. And they became used by Western capitalism and they are denied their humanity um, by Western academia or by the Western legacies of Egyptian archaeology. The final comic that we used, and this was uh, one of uh, our biggest hits, and our biggest hits not, in, not only in the sense of likes and shares, but we got uh, most of the comments that we got on most of the, com uh, on most of the comics we had, we got it on, on this very comic. Uh, this was initially, and this was in a response to the discussions that have been um, recently in the UK after the studies of um, like the reconstruction of the voice of the mummy and the many unethical studies that came out and about recently in some UK museums, not all of course, and the calls for an ethical review. But what was interesting there is that everyone had an opinion of um, how there is, a, there is a need to reconsider or there is a need of an ethical reconsideration except for the Egyptians. And then you would realize you are confronted once again that even in our in our current uh, let's say campaign to confront the colonial legacies, we equally uh, this uh, we 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 equally disenfranchise the Egyptians once again. So we're we're adding another repressive cycle, um, perhaps unwillingly or perhaps like unintentionally, but it, we're we're equally oppressive as as the earlier archaeologists as well by totally denying the egyptians a voice where there is so much concerns of what the ancient uh, egyptians would have thought while there is very very little concern of what the modern egyptian today think and that 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 that, that should make us question the extent of which we ourselves today or like um, the current wave of the history of egyptian archaeology tends to equally believe that the modern egyptians have an agency or have some sort of ownership over uh, their heritage. So this is uh, what we've done. We, we've made a comic and that was very much uh, inspired by an Egyptian uh, movie called uh, the, uh, the Great Father Beans of China. And it's a meme that we tend to use in Egypt on how if there are two people, like if there is a group of three and two are in discussion where the person in the middle is totally ignored and totally isolated. And that was the case here in the comic where Nasser and myself are in the middle between two white male scholars and that was intentional and they were both discussing um, researching the mummy if they should unwrap it if it should be seated etc while uh, me and Nasser were trying to make up an opinion but obviously uh, no one no one could hear us what was interesting here um, is the responses that we got from the Egyptians and I do have to say like um, I was really really surprised and if not emotionally touched by how most of the debates and discussions that we had in academia uh, it seems that the public are totally beyond us. They've already, they, they like what we get into circles of debates while they, they just state things as they are and they tend to have their own solutions. And they tend to think of how this is, they, they, they've, they've made their own ethical review only through the comments that we've got on social media and how like initially anyone who's working with human remains should think, should imagine themselves first in the place of the human understudy. And I think for me, that was profound and, and that's, the way I've, I've always thought about it, like you have to put yourself in the shoes of this or like you put yourself in the place of this uh, very human being that you're deciding his fate and they are actually today helpless. What was again like to bring, and this is the last slide, but to bring us uh, um, to the initial discussion of how we tend to decide of ancestorships or we tend to decide of who is uh, the the successor of who, based on, again, the Western views of race or the Western views of how a community should be shaped or familial links. But uh, for us in Egypt or in, well, in the Egyptian community in general, and perhaps in the wider Middle Eastern community, this has to do with emotions more than um, bloodlines. And this is something that came from uh, Zainab Hashish. And Zainab Hashish, she's um, a poly like she does specialize in human, in researching human remains herself. And, the way she she described the mummy at the Pichi Museum, she had no she she 
she didn't re openly discuss whether it should be displayed or not. Although um, I think that later on when we had discussions, we, we, we tended to find that the way it's displayed, although it's quite discreet, like you don't, you don't get to see, for those who've been to the Pichin Museum, you don't, you, you don't get confronted with the mummy straight away. You, you're given a warning as well from, from, um, from a panel, but you equally don't get to see the body the way it's photographed here, but it's, it's a bit disturbing. But she says that she does sympathize with the woman there and she, she sympathize with her because she has no say of her fate of what should be happening to her today. In conclusion, or what I wanted to bring forward is that sometimes even when we're trying to claim that what we're doing is ethical, um, it's only ethical by academic terms. And we tend to um, forget, or, or I don't know, we tend to dismiss the fact of how heritage or history, this is, um, this is something that belongs to everyone, not just academia. And this belongs to the community, first of all. And this decisions when it comes to human remains particularly, it does have to have far more public input than academic. I'm not denying an academic input, but I think that primarily it has to be uh, the people who have um, a say on how or why or if um, human remains should be display, displayed at all or should be researched at all because most of um, the responses that we've got from our comics people, like most of the Egyptians, believe that they should be actually reburied once again and respected. So this is just, um, it, it was a way of amplifying the voices or the responses that we've got. And just trying in this panel to reflect more on how we can ensure that more public opinions or more community voices are included in such discussions, even if it's um, in a lighthearted comic. Thank you all so much and apologies for all the Wi-Fi issues I've had earlier. Thank you so much, Heba. I'm so glad that it ended up working in the end. So, um, so all of the speakers have spoken. So I guess we could all come back to start your videos and unmute yourselves and we could go through the questions. We received some really thoughtful questions. Um, and actually Ahmed has replied to a few of the questions and it's worth uh, reading his responses. They're very good. Um, so one of the first questions that we got was from Anne Austin who said that the concept of the body and its boundaries are, is culturally constructed. And uh, so how do, we, how do we extend our ethical considerations to other cultural concepts of the body? And do, so do we extend our, all of our ethical considerations to coffins, statues, canopic jars, and uh, basically all burial goods, which is what most ancient Egyptian collections are, really? So I don't know if anyone wanted to talk about that. Maybe maybe I can say something. I think it's just I. This is interesting because this comes not only when with conceptions of the body, but with displays of any. I don't know. I don't like using the word objects, but any remains that came from earlier societies, be it human remains or belongings, because we tend to forget how this is. It it, it was. It could have been something that you paid all your like earnings just to make a small jar or whatever to take it with you to the afterlife. And this is interesting of how sometimes in the decisions of what has to be put on display or what goes in storage. And usually this is again a curatorial decision that is based on how the public, what the public want to see, etc. But then it ends up being unethical because many of uh, the unfinished objects end up in storage for the rest of their lives or end up uh, being perceived as orphaned objects or like ugly um, objects. But then in reality, um, these unfinished objects, in my view, are far more important than, uh, than a complete royal figure because a complete royal figure is complete because it comes from a certain strand of society. It's, it's for a king after all. So there was so much care and money and resources put into it. But then again, it's, it's the injustice that we're putting even to belongings of ancient human beings where we are making decisions of what is worthy and what's unworthy based on um, our academic criteria, which is usually um, unemotional. It's, it's just very materialistic and it's based on um, uh, typologies of objects and it's based on reconstructed scientific uh, categories that didn't exist in the past. So I, I, I totally agree. I think these ethical reviews should, should consider not only human remains, all, all, everything, all the remains that we've got uh, 
from like past societies should be treated with the same ethics, not only in terms of they should be displayed or not, but in terms of how we put value on them, even like um, scientific or emotional value to objects. Yeah. Because our biases are like, yeah, deconstructing the past so much. I feel like in every Twitter conversation that I've had with Christina Riggs before, every time someone says that human remains are human and they're people, she always comes in and says, but they're also sacred objects in a way. And a lot of other objects are also sacred. So they yeah. have a lot of the same sensibilities around like secrecy, should they even be seen? Yeah. Should they be displayed? I think, yeah. I think Alice had something to say. And since she well, does. I just completely agree with Heba. And I was thinking of NAGPRA, of course, which is not just about human remains, it includes um, cultural objects as well. And I think there's, I think there is a move in the museum sector. I mean, I think historically museums have been about categorizing, typologizing, fetishizing the object. But I think we do start to see a move now to curating relationships. Um, and that's as much about relationships between people, between objects. Um, so I think there is a process of rehumanizing going. So I think this is a, a really, so yeah, I think, I think just to silo um, human remains is to miss that wider picture. So I think that's a great question and uh, something to reflect further on. Um, so one thing I'd like to um, mention, I mean, going on what Ahmed then mentioned, I mean, so much of this is contextual, it's context dependent, right? The, the, the conditions under which you encounter a collection or an object or, you know, and, and I would say that for us, since I teach at an archaeological museum, which is a teaching collection, and students are working with objects in every single one of my classes, what I take very seriously is, you know, from the very beginning, pointing out most of the material we're interacting with is funerary in nature, just given the kind of colonial histories of, you know, how these materials were collected and brought to us. So that involves a very different kind of mindset. I think similar to what Ahmed was saying, when you're in this context of learning from someone, you cannot walk in in sort of cavalier way. It just requires a completely different approach and it requires you constantly remembering that you, you owe something to these people who have left something behind that you're now able to interact with. And in my view, the, the f undergraduate who has never worked in a museum collection, you know, 18 years old, first time having an opportunity to work with something, they get it because they know, you know, this is a real person. You can't just, you know, take this as, as fun. Um, it may be really enjoyable. It may be an incredible opportunity, but at the end of it, it is the history of somebody's life and really a whole bunch of people's lives, right? So that is not to be taken in a very cavalier way. And I, and I find that introducing things within that context and with that expectation really changes the way that we can work with these collections more respectfully. Thank you so much. Um, we got uh, another question from Maura Carousel about the word mummy itself, and that's something that I've discussed with Heba before, so I, I thought it would be interesting to bring it up. She's asking, the term mummy slash mummies, it, should we use it or not? Is this a museum construct? <laughs> Heba, do you want to... I'll say things I might regret later. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I, I don't think I'm. I, especially with all the, with all the the baggage that comes with it today, like uh, even the movies or the these, like you know, it, I, I'm totally against using the word, and and that's why even in the title today we we meant it in a provocative, like your mommy is their ancestors, because people need to reflect on the terminologies they use, because like um, you're diluting a human being into a word that is mommy, and you 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 you're equally it's insulting. I, I, I find it insulting. I, I personally find, find it insulting. So I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I, I now, I, I, I remembered something. It's a personal story that I hope you don't mind me sharing. But um, I've always had a problem with the displays of, of human remains in general. But I think it, it was the moment when, when my mom passed away that um, afterwards, whenever I walk into any gallery, if I see mummies on display, I can never look because I, I I always think of my mom and I, I would never want my mom to be displayed in, in a way like this. Neither would I want her to be called a mommy if, if her body is, is mummified. And I, it's, yeah, I, I don't know. And, and, that, and that's why I, I'm thinking of the comments that we've got, like, usually if, if you put yourself 
would you want yourself to be called uh, an object? Like, would I, want, would, would I want to be called because I'm quite tall? Would I, would I want to be called after I die like sugarcane? I wouldn't. Because, well, so, so I, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that does make sense. I think we're used to mummy as just for like from an art conservation perspective, from a material perspective, it means there's soft tissues still. But yeah. I totally see how it participates in objectifying the remains, making them the mummy, which is an object, which is a yeah. museum thing, which people come to see. I don't know if anyone else had something to say about this, but we'll move on. Okay, so we got we have so many questions, we won't be able to get to every single one. But um, there's a question here from Jasmine Day about, so, so um, all, that all of this would lo logically lead to the withdrawal of mummies from display, even from scientific study or excavation. At what point, if any, should we stop this logical progression? And she's asking about the public who wants to see mummies. So I think this is, I think we should, we could talk about, um, and she's asking also about um, what about what if one commu one Egyptian community disagrees with another Egyptian communities or a European community? So who should we talk to? Who decides what the end point is, basically? I think as someone working in a Western museum on an Egyptian mummy, I think this is particularly difficult because it's hard to know exactly which community you should talk to. So I'm wondering also what are the differences between working in Egypt or working in uh, the West? Um, Sanchita? So, I mean, I, I would say there are a couple things to think about. You know, first, if the public is upset that they're not able to have access to this kind of experience, you know, we have to problematize that, right? Like, why do you feel that you have access to this experience? What, what, what has actually made it possible for you to expect to see these people laid out for you in, in the way that you, you know, can consume them? So I think we have to problematize it and explain, it, you know, in greater transparency why this has come to be a kind of accepted, normalized practice. And to say, we're actually taking an important kind of ethical stand, we're thinking about humans as humans. Um, and I think if you can make those kinds of arguments in very clear ways and also do the emotional work, right? I think these are very emotional things. Um, we need to be able to say we're not trying to be sort of objective and scientific. We're being emotional because we're humans, right? So I think that's one thing that needs to be done. And I think the other thing is this expectation that there's going to be one perspective that we should follow. We need to let go of this, right? This is crazy. This is the kind of racist and colonial legacy, well, ongoing situation that continues to put pressure on the one person who is, say, Egyptian in the case of Heba, or the one sort of, you know, indigenous person who has to speak for every, you know, indigenous community member's experience. I mean, that is, that is just insane. So I think we just, we just need to be a lot more frank, a lot more transparent, and also just deeply emotional. This is hard. We're going to get it wrong, but we're just going to keep trying because we, we owe it to our fellow human beings. That's how I feel we should. Thank you, Sanchita. Um, I was just, I really um, appreciate what Sanchita was saying earlier about creating a particular mindset and how we're approaching. And that's one of the things I was trying to get across with this idea of radical transparency is one of the things that we've seen in museums is that they are receptive to ethics, but it's just been so rigid. And so we now commonly see that label, you know, human, there are humans on display and that's, that's seen as a kind of tokenistic, um, oh, we've addressed some ethics, we've, we've raised that. Um, I think there has to be, an, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. It's not just, there's not going to be one stock answer to doing that. It's going to be a series of, of labels and contexts and taking the public from a place that they know and that they're comfortable um, and taking them to a place that they don't know. And I think um, we underestimate museum visitors that, you know, they're not willing to go on that, that journey. I um, mean, it's, you know, I know that Manchester Museum struggled with this when they had their covering the mummies approach. Um, and I'm sure there were lots of lessons to be learned about how, how, how that was framed um, and about that conversation. But I think what that example highlighted is that this is, that would be, it's going to be difficult. Um, 
seeing mummies in a museum has become such a taken for granted experience. People really, that's, they really expect, you know, museums are part of priming people, you know, that they'll, they'll see mummies, they'll get to buy a chocolate mummy in the gift shop. Um, so, it, you know, there needs, I think there needs to be a, a complete reframing um, to take people on that journey. And I think people would be willing to go on that journey and an emotional one as well. So lots to, lot of work to be done. It was um, about the um, museums relying on mummies a lot for for big shows and for um, publicity. There was someone asked, "How do we how do we feel from an ethical point of view about museums around the world financially benefiting from the display of ancient Egyptian mummies, or sending collections of them in touring exhibitions?" So I don't know if someone has something to say about about this specifically. I guess we have kind of addressed it a little bit. Uh, I don't mind. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd say, I mean, you, again, way up, what's the positives and what's the negatives of, of, of the situation? If you're going to share a story, you're going to develop learning points. You're like, uh, I was speaking to Professor Stevenson. She, she was my mentor on my project. So she, she was saying to me that for children, the first interaction that they will have with death is through a mum. Right, that is that has value to it, right? So I, I don't think that like I can understand why people are scared or worried about uh, not being able to have that as an interaction. And I don't think that museums profiting from that is necessarily a bad thing. I think what is a bad thing though is for museums to to or or for for individuals to feel entitled to the right, and for museums to feel like they own the, the this these human remains and that they can use them how they want and that there should be no end point i think that's what then allows you to then lose respect for that not that the fact that the museum is benefiting from it not that the fact that um, it can be shipped around to different exhibitions around the world i think it's the fact that there is no end point so for the previous question i think acknowledging the, that i think that the question was phrased in the sense that oh we acknowledge that there, is, there should be an end point but how do we decide when it is I think like accepting that there is an endpoint is already a massive hurdle, but I think it's something that people have to accept. I think that's the most problematic thing. But museums profiting, like museums are providing a benefit as well. They're sharing a story, they're providing an interaction uh, with death for for so many people around the world. They're they're introducing ancient Egypt, which isn't like such a fascinating part of history to so many different people. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing and that museums shouldn't profit. Thank you. And I just have to say something. It, it can be a bad thing when this comes on the expense of modern communities who end up being um, totally stereotyped or stigmatized against because of the way the ancient society is presented mm -hmm. against um, the absolute um, invisibility of the modern societies. So people end up, we, we um, it oppresses us in a way. The way the way ancient Egypt is presented in museums today, even in museums in Egypt, um, is oppressive for the modern communities because it makes us absolutely invisible from Egypt's story. We don't exist. So we, the people end up knowing Egypt as the pyramids, but they know nothing about us. And, and this has um, a huge emotional impact and self-defeat of the communities today. And um, I think it, it does have a huge impact equally on even east and west relationships like this goes beyond the walls of museums it has it does have an impact on international relations because of how um for example people would be very happy to see ancient egypt inside but maybe if i'm walking by the walls of the british museum i would get insulted because i'm wearing a hijab and i'm equally egyptian so so these these invisibilities they do have a real impact on us the way museums present our past has a real impact on how we are, uh, I would say, unseen today. I'm looking through the questions and there's just so much, so there's no way we'll get to everyone. But um, I guess on this uh, topic, someone mentioned that the British Museum offers special tours for sponsors of their dedicated mummy store. So I think that's another it's, it's a slightly different conversation, I think, because it's not for like public good, 
and say, but I, yeah, I think it was just interesting to mention it. Um, someone, um, Jean Dendy asked about the, the end point that Ahmed talked about, because in medicine you have you, something specific that you want to do with the body and then there's an end point and then you stop using that body. So I guess, well, it's a tough question as deaccessioning always is, like what, what do we do at the end point with ancient Egyptian mummies? I don't know if anyone has talked, think the, uh, thought about that before, but. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a go. I mean, firstly, I think from, I don't know, I'm, I haven't done massive in-depth research into this, but from what I have seen, like my understanding of ancient Egypt and what an ancient Egyptian typical individual would have wanted is for their tomb to be undisturbed and for them to be buried and remain in the land of Egypt. So from my understanding, that, like, that very clearly says, return them to Egypt, right? Um, but everyone feels like they have a massive stakeholding in ancient Egyptian culture and, and history. And I think that then makes it hard for people to let go. But like, when we talk about consent, there was no way to, to, to ask these individuals, these human beings, what they would have wanted in their future. But I'm sure that what has happened to them, being shipped around the world, being taken from their tombs, being dissected and dismembered and having an arm presented in one museum, a head presented in another museum, a hand in another museum, is not what they would have wanted. So I think you then have a duty, okay, you've done your learning, you've involved different stakeholders, you've introduced people to ancient Egypt, you've, you've got the scientific, the cultural, the, the benefit from all of this, but it's time to regroup that mummy if it has been dismembered and return it to where, where it came from, where it was taken from in the first place. I think that, that, that is the thing that makes the most sense in terms of respect and dignity and making amends for, for what has been done. Thank you. That, that's very interesting. Um, this is actually my question. I'm wondering about um, medical ethics and, and, and the idea of consent. I was wondering how that relates to images of ancient Egyptian human remains. And not only photos of them, but also CT scans, x-rays and everything, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't share that kind of medical information with any other, with, I guess, medical human remains. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's really interesting because anything to do with that human being that can identify them, you need consent for. You need consent to be able to share all of, all of those features, whether it's CTC. And we, we don't even know what's going to be developed in the future that will allow us to understand remains in a different way. And, but the principle of consent has always been there. Obviously, there was no consent for any of this. Um, but again, for me, in my mind, ethics is all about weigh, weighing things up because it's not a black and white thing. It's, it's a massive gray area. Everything we're dealing with is a gray area. So if you're going to weigh it up, then there has been benefits, which we've spoken about already. And there is benefits to trying to understand CT scans and images and increasing accessibility and all of that. But I think the broad point that, that I firmly believe in is there has to be an end point to all of it because there was no consent at the start and there was no like we are pretty sure based on our whole picture of ancient Egypt that this isn't something that people wouldn't have wanted. Right. So to me it, like all the material needs to have some sort of firm end point. Where that is that that's a massive discussion to, to be had. Thank you. I think Sanchita had something to say. So I, I'm really I I would love an endpoint. You know, this is these are this is when you you want the answer because you know how murky all of these things are, right? I, I wish there were an easy way to figure this out. And you know, here in on Turtle Island in North America, there's the Native American Graves Repatriation Act, and you know, for since 1992, right, we've been trying to return Indigenous ancestors to their descendants, and it's a really complicated political, emotional, financially 
difficult process. It's, it's really hard, especially when there's no documentation for where these people came from. Um, I'm not saying that isn't worth doing. It is absolutely worth doing. But I, I think it just makes clear that this is not something we can solve now in 10 years, maybe in 100 years. So we have to be in this for a very, very long kind of engaged, protracted process that is still going to be messy at the very end. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, part of my experience having worked with these individuals for a long time, so the person we now call the Goucher Mummy, I've known her for 13 years. She's on view in our museum as part of a longstanding agreement with Goucher College, who owns her. Um, and I've, I've known her for 13 years. You know, I am kind of very deeply invested in her as a person. And what would it mean to have an endpoint to that relationship? And to me that, and I'm sorry, there's a massive truck going by in my house now. Um, and I know that having her on display, as problematic as this is, and we've really tried to think about how we might change this once we're finally able to return to campus, um, having her on display means that people can know her and visit her. I know that I rely as a conservator on making sure she's okay because there are, of course, conservation issues that come up, right? And honestly, when you have, you have worked with someone, right? I've worked with her for a really long time. I, I mean, I say hello to her in the morning. I say goodbye to her when I leave at the end of the day. Um, she's there. She witnesses all the classes that come in and out. Uh, so there's a different kind of relationship that, that just develops because you're aware of them as humans also, you know, interacting with you in daily life. So to me, the idea of an endpoint is just tricky because what would that feel like? What would that look like? And does that mean then putting her in a different box in a different room where no one visits her, right? So I'm just saying this to say that it's really complicated. It's very emotional and the best I can think of is we have to keep working on this and our thinking will change. Just as my thinking has changed since the first time I encountered her and it will be different when I go back and see her after all of these months, you know, not having been able to, to be there. So that's just my perspective. Thank you. Um, I guess we're approaching the end of this, of this panel discussion. So we, and we just got a question from Angela. I, I don't, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her last name correctly and I should because it's French, but um, her question is, what can we do from now on? So she's asking that from the position of someone who has no ties to in academic institutions or a museums and a platform, but I think it also applies to people who do have ties to academic institutions and to museums. What do we think a next step is? Alice? One of the things, so earlier this year, there were those two scientific studies that came out. Ahmed's referred to one of them, the vocal cords have come up. Um, and uh, a couple of us really did feel that one of the things that needed to be done, that there was needed, there need, did need to be an ethical review to reinvigorate debate because um, Egyptian uh, human remains have been, have been sort of um, enveloped into a general discussion about human remains. And of course, the dead are present in our museum collections in a multitude of different ways. Um, but I would say the, um, the remains from Egypt um, they occupy such a privileged position in our public visibility that I think they do need some dedicated consideration and they are so incredibly widespread as well. I mean, um, libraries, schools, um, you know, they're, they've become all sorts of different types of entities in so many different types of places and I think they are deserving of a specific set of guidelines. So I think that's something that uh, would be worthwhile pursuing personally personally for a lot of people that aren't um, perhaps as um, you know haven't been involved in, in the discussions and all the sort of academic um, developments we've seen around understanding colonialism and its relevance to Egyptology about Egyptian perspectives on this um, and all of those um, different aspects I think we can bring that together to provide something that's um, not guidance, not rules to follow, but um, some sort of new departure point for people to continue this conversation and process. Um, so that's something that I think would be very worthwhile pursuing. 
Thank you. Sanjita? Um, I would say what's really important when thinking about uh, pursuing any kind of research or study about ancient Egyptian human remains is to be really clear about what your motivation is, right? Why, why do you feel that this is something that is appropriate for your kind of research value or your exhibition value? And I think really articulating what that is and thinking about how that, that sits with you, right? Um, I, I think that, that lack of clarity about why we feel <laughs> that this is acceptable research will, will help guide us through some of the really tricky parts um, and the kind of full transparency of, of how we've made these decisions, I think is the only way we can move forward. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, so I think something that we all meet on is this idea of radical transparency and how it's necessary. It's, it's essential to medical ethics. It's essential to acknowledging colonial histories and to engaging with communities. So I think that's something that we all agree on. It, it also made me think of how uh, Sanchita, in your writing, you've often acknowledged mistakes that you've made in the past or things that you think you should have done differently and I think that's definitely part of it and that's something that speaking as a conservator I don't think we do that often enough and I think that's that would be part of it saying that there have been mistakes made in the past but also in the very very recent past and maybe by people who are who share our goals and our professions. I, I just want to say something because um, I was reminded that how we've all and we, we've repeated the word ethics a lot, but then without defining what do we mean by ethics, because in the end of the day, it means different things to different people, not only as communities, but even as human beings, like my ethical standpoints, which of course comes from my biases, my background, etc., would be different than Alice's, even it would be different from um, another Egyptian, let's say. So sometimes we tend to openly use the word ethics, but I think that if, if this is what we are hoping for an ethical, a more ethical approach to things, maybe we need to define first what, what do you mean by ethics in, in this context or whose ethics are, are we talking about? Because um, it's, uh, it's individual and it's equally personal. So I, I don't know if we, or maybe as Sanchita has been saying that we need to be open that there are different solutions or different answers and there, there is no one way of doing things in general. So I don't think that there would, we can come up with a, a, a one to 10 guide, like this is how ethically you can do things. Like this is, we can say this is some of the ethics that, that you can do things and obviously things would change or things would be different, but, but it's just, it, 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 it was brought to my attention even for something like very little, like working with communities, like the ethics form we have to fill in a Western university. Uh, totally don't exist in the Egyptian community. People won't even don't have any any opposition of having themselves photographed or being videoed, even the kids. But uh, if I do it for UCL, this is a nightmare. Like I cannot name people. I cannot take photographs of anyone. Although people actively want to have their photographs taken. And imagine that you're doing something for the community, and because I'm getting funding from UCL. I can't even show their faces, although they want to show their faces. <laughs> so this, this is where, where, where it becomes tricky, particularly to things that involve indigenous cultures or heritage that is dispersed elsewhere around the world. Ethics is like, um, um, there, there is no one way of, of defining what is an ethical way of doing things, because it, I think it, it, differ, it differs from one part of the world to the other, even from one person to the other. Thank you, Heba. Yeah, that's that's definitely important. We do need to define what we mean by ethics. And obviously we don't have time to do that now because no. the panel is ending, but I think it's something we do need we do all need to think about. Yeah. Um, yeah, whose ethics and, and how do we define them and what place they have in our process. Yeah. Because it does feel like often it's just a checkbox. Exactly. exactly, yeah. Okay, well, I think that's it for today. Oh, Sanchita, go ahead. Just very quickly, I mean, the best way to understand each other's ethics is to have a conversation exactly, yeah. over coffee, you know, <laughs> yes. just talk to people. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. not that hard if we're willing yeah. to talk to people. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. And if things are more than an ethical review form, like it's just more of a human interaction rather than just an admin, an admin form that museums have to fill. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. So I guess this is it. Thank you so much for 
participating, everyone. It's been awesome to hear from all of you. Great presentations and then a great discussion. Um, I also want to thank Catherine Bruin, Usama Gad, Rachel Mares, Carl Graves, and Stephanie Boonstra for organizing and supporting this panel. And special thanks to Heba also for helping me co-write the description for the event with me. So it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope everyone at home enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much. <laughs>